Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining my wife and I today in our living room as we videotape this sermon and send it to you. We appreciate being here today. Today is one day after the Feast of Epiphany in the Christian calendar. And it talks about the affirmation of Jesus' two natures. Actually, they say uh, in their description, the revelation of Jesus, two natures. The scripture is correct on that, but we're going to be talking about the affirmation of Jesus' two natures today. The affirmation of Jesus' two natures came through revelation in the scriptures and in the miracles that happened on earth. Before we go any further, uh, we'd like to pray about this, so if you'll please join with me, we'll pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to us so that we could be saved and reconciled to you. We recognize, dear God, that we needed to have your Son sent to us. Thank you, Father. So help us to understand his nature. He had two natures. He was fully man and fully God. And because of that, he was able to go to the cross and be the lamb, the perfect lamb for the slaughter to forgive the sins of the world. And then the resurrection from the dead occurred and we received the Holy Spirit because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us. We thank you. We ask and pray your blessing to be with this message and that you'll help us to see from your word how this is true. In your most holy name, Jesus, we pray it, and all together we say, Amen. Well, the affirmation miracle came through the three wise men, or magi, coming to Jerusalem as they followed Jesus' star in the east. But let's begin with the scripture revelations found in the Word of God. If you'll turn to Isaiah, the seventh chapter out of the I'm reading from the NIV version, so whatever version you have, that's fine. Isaiah 7 and verse 13. Isaiah 7 verse 13, Then Isaiah said, Hear now the house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? And that's where we are sometimes in our living. Therefore, in verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel means God with us. So here the sign is going to be that from a virgin, God was going to have his son Emmanuel come forth. And that would be the sign above all signs, in all of creation, as to what God was doing with humanity, His creation, humanity. And what a wonderful sign it is. And we're going to look at that, but He had to be of man, the Virgin, and of God, the Spirit, to be Emmanuel. Let's notice that over in Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew, the first chapter, beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And that was good of him to feel that way. But he didn't understand. But it says in verse 20 of Matthew 1, After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now that is why she was a virgin. And that's why God intervened and he betrothed, he begot, I should say, he begot his son Jesus in her womb. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 
all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. And Jesus still has the name Jesus today. Because he fully understands us and he fully involved himself in us like in Mary's womb and then in his entire ministry and now he wants us to fully involve ourselves in him through the Spirit so we are one with him as he is one with us you see how all that works all that beautiful oneness of the whole universe in Jesus it's amazing really amazing now in Luke 1, we see another aspect of what God was doing in Mary uh, when she was pregnant. But first we see her becoming pregnant and then her pregnancy that followed. So Luke 1 verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town of Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I bet she was. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Son of the Most High. In other words, he'd be called God, is what that means. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The kingdom will never end. And so he's going to be king over the throne of David, king of Judah, or king of the Jews, king of Judah, or king of the Jews. And he would be then king of kings, lord of lords, over all of creation. Well, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So Elizabeth, or even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And we need to remember that today. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled, and may that be true for us. Then the angel left her. So then we go to where Mary visits Elizabeth. In verse 39. At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby it should have been John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So something really special happened then when they met. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth asked Mary. And as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Now that is an amazing leap, a leap for joy. I don't know exactly what the difference is, a leap for joy or a leap of some other kind, but it was very significant to Elizabeth. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Just like we need to be confident he will fulfill 
His promises to us. So, there was something very special going on. John the Baptist, who was a miracle child in himself, recognized that he was going to be introducing Jesus as the Son of God at the River Jordan when he was asked by Jesus himself to baptize him. So, what a wonderful thing. The Son of God was going to be born of Mary going to come out of Mary's womb and he was to be Jesus the one who saves <clears throat> so now let us go back uh, to Isaiah Isaiah the ninth chapter now and verse 6 Isaiah 9 and verse 6 for to us a child is born, to us, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see the titles that this baby boy has, has when he's born. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing it, and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on, from the time of his birth on, and then forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Oh, what a prophecy. And so when the Holy Spirit told Mary that, and when Elizabeth told Mary that, that's why they knew that to be true. Because Isaiah was inspired to write that about Jesus being born of Mary as fully God and fully man. And this is something we celebrate because we are involved in that because Jesus has involved himself in that and has included us in that. Hallelujah and praise our God, our mighty God. Let's now go to John the first chapter. John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning, well, where does eternity begin? It doesn't. So in the beginning, maybe that was at the beginning of the world. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning. So he's always been here, always been God, and now he's going to come down to the earth as Jesus. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. So he was the creator word. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So he was the, the sun in the heavens and the moon at night in the heavens. He was all light throughout creation. All the starlight in the heavens, he created the light. He created all light. He created light for us to have. He was that light for us. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness wants to overcome the light, but darkness cannot overcome light. Light overcomes darkness every time. So if we take our lampshade off of our heads and we are the light of Jesus it will be seen it will move the darkness out of our way around us that's what light does even though people don't believe it still does that so we need to walk in the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus since he is our light in verse 9 the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's you and me today. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. We're born of God in the Spirit. 
today because of Jesus. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. He is the author of grace and truth. He's the originator of grace and truth, as expressed in our Father sending Him to us. We are so blessed to have Him as our Savior and our Lord today. So this is where we come to the wise men coming because they weren't there at the birth of Jesus. That is when they saw the star in the east and they called it the Jesus star. Now, these were leaders in Persia and they were called wise men or magi and they studied the heavens. And so when they saw this star that God created and put there for this very special occasion, they noted it had special significance and knew that it was a sign from God to show who the Son of God was who was being born and where the Son of God was being born. So they got their equipment together and their camels and all that that they needed to take a long journey and they started following the star from Persia all the way to Bethlehem. And they'll end up first in Jerusalem and then they'll go to Bethlehem, which is about six miles away. Oh, here they are, they're coming ready to worship Jesus, to worship Him, not to pay homage to Him, but to worship Him. So we see that over in Matthew, the second chapter. Matthew 2 and verse 1. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Well, Herod had no desire to worship him. In fact, he didn't even know he was born. <laughs> he didn't know. All of his, you know, priests who studied these things in the scripture, they didn't know. Now, they then rushed to the scriptures to look it up, and they found it. But then they didn't know before that. So, it says in verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. <laughs> I guess so. Who's this other king of the Jews? And all Jerusalem with him, and when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And you can just see them scrambling around. In Bethlehem and Judea. See, they could find it in the scripture. It was revealed in the scripture. <laughs> For this is what the prophet has written. So here it is. Micah 5, 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And that's exactly where he was born, right? Bethlehem in a manger around where the shepherds watch their flocks at night. See, exactly like the scripture says. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, which would have been about two years before. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him, which is not what he had in mind. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. So it was two years later, so they weren't in the manger. They were in a home of some kind in Bethlehem. And so when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. It had been a two-year journey. They were so happy to get there and to actually see the boy Jesus 
the Son of God. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. That was the first thing they did. Because they knew who he was. It's not a matter of dates, it's a matter of who. That's what worship implies. The what is different. The time is different. The who is critical. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the gold representing kingship, the frankincense denoting priestly duties, and the myrrh indicating there would be a death. And he would be the one giving his life for the world, and he would die on a cross so that his blood shed would forgive all the sins of humanity. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So the angel protected them so they didn't have to go back and have Herod interrogate them further. So that led to Herod then killing all the baby boys, young boys now, age two and under, he killed them all. There's great wailing because one ruler was jealous of the Son of God being the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if he, being led of the devil, could do that, then he could snuff out Jesus. God's answer to our need of being saved from our sins. The world has to suffer because the devil is still out there. He doesn't have power, but he has sway. And he can sway people in leadership to make horrible decisions. And he does, often. Because power corrupts. And the corruption comes from Satan. And we live in a world full of it today. So we have to be the light because Jesus is the light. And we need to do what Jesus would do if he were alive now. And he is. He is alive now in the Spirit, and he's in us. So let us go now to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. 2 Corinthians 5. We see here that we are to respond to God's inclusion of us in himself. He included himself fully in us, identified with us, still does, because he's now... No, but the right hand of the Father with his physical body and the wounds of his sacrifice still in his body. And now he says he has given us an invitation to come to him for him to live in us and us to live in him in the spirit. So he includes us in the spirit today. And this is what he says that we should be doing as this new creation we are. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We see his two natures and how he used those to include us as the children of our Father. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here, and all this is from God our Father who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So he says to us, we must do these things that our Father is now asking us to do. We have been reconciled to our Father through Jesus, through his death and resurrection. Now our Father says to us, we are to do the ministry of Christ's reconciliation today. Every believer is included in this man date that we've been given by our Father. <clears throat> and that means, as it says in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So we had a, a Savior who forgave us our sins. And he's also attributed to us his righteousness. And he has now committed to us, Jesus has, 
the message of reconciliation. First of our Father commits it to us, then Jesus commits the message to us to speak of, to give testimony of, of how this has been a part of our lives in Jesus Christ. So we are therefore, in verse 20, Christ ambassadors. We have a voice and we need to use it. We have an influence. We need to express it. We all have a testimony of God's love for us. We need to let it be known. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the whole message of the gospel. That's the whole message from Genesis 3.15 to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20. And all the way then through Revelation, when Jesus returns in glory, and as we find in 1 John 3, 1 and 2, that when He does, and we do, when He returns and we ret go up to meet Him in the air as the new body that we'll have at the resurrection, we then will see Him as He is because we will be like Him, it says. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. We should be looking forward to that because we have a work to do now in unite, helping the body of Christ be united together as the oneness unto Christ because of the wonderful message of the gospel that we have the opportunity and privilege to express to everyone we come into contact with. The world needs this message of God's love for us so much and it comes to us. We say, well, I'm not worthy of this. Well, Isaiah felt that, but then he realized, well, okay, choose me. You know, we have to do at least the same and find that God will use us in ways that will amaze us. So let us pray about this together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to us, and we thank you, dear God, that we can be who we are in you. You have made us who you are, and you identify with us completely and wholly and totally. We are so loved. It is beyond our comprehension how much you love us, but help us to understand. And as it says in the scripture, we love you because you first loved us. And here we are, dear God, and the world needs you like it never has before throughout all history. And we come to pray together for the oneness that you have made us with yourself in the Spirit, now that we are the children of God, our Father. We ask and pray our bless your blessing, therefore, to be upon us, to help us to have a voice, to have the courage and the strength and the inspiration to express the testimony you've given to us. So please inspire us, encourage us, and strengthen us. Please protect us from Satan and his demons. In your most holy and righteous name, Jesus, we pray. And all together we say, Amen. Amen.